We're down here at Winton Motor Raceway in the Hyundai XL garage, and we've got James Lodge here in the number 39 car. James, what is it that brought you to Hyundai XLs in the first place, mate? Uh, yeah, well, it's a one-make series, so all the cars are the same, and it's a really good stepping stone into further categories like TCR, eventually supercars. You learn the basics, fundamentals, and yeah, cheaply, so it's a good series. And what's the racing like for these cars around Winton? When you've got a pack of dozens and dozens of these cars, bumper to bumper, how does it, what's it like driving these in a big pack of cars? Yeah, it gets pretty hectic. Um, you can get like five wide down the straight, but um, the racing's mostly clean and you get some really good action on the TV and yeah, it's great racing. You're one of the quicker blokes I hear around the paddock at the moment in the XLs. What are your hopes like for the rest of the season going forward, mate? Oh, uh, well, I would like to win the championship. That's the goal. But um, I'm just going to go out there, do my best, see what happens. All the best, mate. Thanks very much. Thank you. James Lodge there, certainly a front runner in the Hyundai Excels this year. That is for certain. Great first round at Sandown as we see the cars head out onto the track for their first race of the weekend. Alongside me once again is Stephen DeFries. Should be an interesting race this one. I think this one will be a rather interesting race, particularly because it's a smaller than usual field. So we're used to seeing Hyundai Excel grids that are you know, upwards of 30 cars sometimes. We haven't got that many here this weekend. So hopefully a nice compact field as we have a look at the starting order here with Cadell Ambrose. This will be his first pole position in Hyundai XL starting off the front row alongside our interviewee just a few moments ago in James Lodge. Harry Tompkins who's been one of the, uh, the front runners in the last couple of seasons at a position three along with Charlie Nash the ticket racing entry at off position four with Jet Murray and Bradley Packham taking up the third row of the grid positions five and six respectively. We've got William Sala is going to be in the number 36 machine out of seventh and then Jason Kay, the number 99 RMJ Crane Repairs car. He's eighth in the running order. Cisco Morales, Stuart Bruckner, Gareth Hodgkiss and Scott Appledore, who's in that iconic livery that you can't miss, the, uh, the tribute livery back to the, uh, the Tirana from the, the, the early 70s there. And you've got uh, Conjoinus in 13th, Carly Fleming, Richard Outram and Keenan Jones in 16th. This is probably getting pretty close to the end of the, uh, the Hyundai Excels. We've got 16 cars on the grid there. We've actually got 16 cars total on the entry list for the weekend, with thanks to Trick Trailers. Yeah, a bit of a uh, smaller grid this weekend, but you do get that when you uh, come to Winton, don't you? It's a bit more of a travel. Some people elect to not to come to Winton, so a bit of a smaller Excel field than what we're used to. But uh, championship-wise, it's certainly all to play for. Top two, uh, not here this weekend. But it's very tight between Harry Tompkins and Cadell Evans. Ten points separating those two in the championship. And then we have James Lodge, who we spoke to just for. He was looking pretty good to be with those two, but DNF in the final race sees him uh, just a few points behind. So it's all to play for with those three as we look. This is final race of today, but plenty of action tomorrow. So we got everything from Formula V, saloon cars, sports sedans, and everything in between. All 20-minute races in the morning, and then the feature race. Few extra points on the line, 25 minutes in the afternoon. So that's what you've got to look forward to tomorrow. If you blue, tune into the blend line coverage or head down to Winton and see it for yourself. Just $10 entry, and if you're under 16, it is free. Absolutely. Just looking at the, the point score you mentioned a few moments ago with the top two absent out of the next... Uh, I think it's like seven or eight cars, everyone down to sort of ninth, tenth, even eleventh. There's plenty of opportunity here for those drivers okay. to gain points over the current series leaders. So they all start to move into position here. This will be an interesting moment here for young Cadell Ambrose, son of uh, longtime proof production legend Rowan Ambrose, off the front row for the very first time with James Lodge alongside in this 16 car field with 25 minutes on the clock. We're expecting somewhere around the 12 to 14 lap mark. Let's see how close we get. Well, depends how many green flags we get. Fingers crossed for a nice trouble free race. Hyundai Excel's race number one is go. Great launch, initial launch from the 194 machine of Cadell Ambrose, then seemed to bog down slightly. And I think that's allowed Lodge to stay alongside and he has. 
But uh, Ambrose holds on position into turn number one. And then Tompkins sitting back in third, and then a bit of a gap back to Nash in fourth position. He initially walked it away from the line beautifully and just had to move a little bit to the right just to cover off a potential advance from Lodge into turn number one. But he held position really well there, Cadell Ambrose, and he had to fend off a little bit of a late challenge there at turn three as well. But it's a long race. There's plenty of time to go as they head through the sweeper here. Different lines through the sweeper. Some people like to take it as a double apex corner, run the car out to the right, then pinch it back for the second part of the corner, and some prefer to stay tight through that section of the track. But what the important part is, is when you get to turn six, you've got to spot the braking mark for turn seven very, very quickly. They've all done a fairly good job of that on this opening tour. And a bit further back in the field here is the number 158 of Jet Murray. He's locking horns with Jason Kay in the 99 machine. Tucked in behind there is William Sala in the 36. So battles up and down the field. There's a lead group of three cars starting to kick away. And there's a good group of cars here starting to find their rhythm as well. Certainly is. Murray with the P-plate, uh, new to the series, having a go up the inside. Uh, not quite uh, able to make it stick, but some really good wheel-to-wheel uh, -wheel battles early on. Oh, I think you might have missed a gear there. And through comes Sala on the outside. You can see the momentum that was lost on the run to turn number 11. He's still got the inside, and he sends it back up there. Nicely well done, nicely judged. Hasn't run too wide, but Sala's still there, holding it around the outside of turn number 12. That's difficult. It's nearly three wide as car number two. Uh, that's Bruckner having a look as well. So really good fight between these three. And it might be three wide as they head down towards turn number one. It looks like Murray's got it now. And it's between Sala. He's going to stick back up the inside now. This is really, really good stuff early on in this one. Certainly is. Plenty of space and respect being shown as well. As the sun starts to get quite low now here at Winton, it's sort of over turn three. So they come out of turn one and two. They get a blinding blister of sun right across the front windshield as they head towards turn three. So it's difficult to spot the braking mark. And there's a, is there another positional change there, I think, as well, after all of this fighting and arguing? It actually allowed Jason Kay to get away out in front. Look, he's got at least a second and a half on the three group on the three cars that were fighting over those couple of spots for seventh, eighth, and ninth. And then the 14 machine of uh, Conjurus and then the 32 of Scott Appledore, they weren't too far away either. So they were kind of hoping that battle was going to continue on for another half a lap or so, give them a shot at uh, pinching a position or two. I think uh, Conjurus actually got involved. I think he tried to uh, hold it around the outside of Bruckner around turn number three, and I think there was a little bit of contact and he's had to uh, pull in back behind, but it was certainly uh, all to play for there. And I'm sure that won't be the end of that battle. Uh, I'm very, very certain of that. And we can see it's not over with the battle for the lead. Ambrose has not been able to break away. And Lodge is all over the tail as they head into turn number 11 for the second time. Yeah, very much all to play for between these two at this point in time. Using a bit of curb and all the road on the outside. Ambrose kicking up a little bit of dust. That's going to be a good incentive for Lodge. You can see Ambrose is trying so hard just to stay ahead at this point in time in the race. It's only lap number two. We've got a long race ahead of us, and already Ambrose using all the road and a bit more just to try and stay ahead. He certainly is. That could have gotten a little bit ugly if he had have not been able to keep get that tyre out of the gravel pretty quickly on the exit of turn 12. And here's Charlie Nash. He's having a very interested look at Harry Tompkins coming down into turn three, and he's got it done. That's a beautiful pass right up in front of the number 33 machine. And it's a little bit interesting in the pits on the uh, the way to dummy grid. I did see Harry Tompkins going through the uh, the paddock area, and he actually had the, uh, it looks like a lockup or something on the left rear corner of the car. The tyre was dragging for a good couple hundred metres down the, uh, the pit paddock complex, and he didn't realise what was going on until someone pulled him up. So I'm not sure if they've had a chance to change that tyre in dummy grid, or if he's going to be nursing that car along with a pretty badly flat-spotted left rear corner tyre all the way through these 25 minutes. So I'm not quite sure what's happened there, but uh, something definitely jammed on on the way to the grid for Harry Tompkins. Certainly something to look out for as this race goes on. That is for certain. As we see the uh, front two continuing to uh, pull away, it's now a case of whether or not Nash can go with them. Nash uh, qualified quite well in the first round on the uh, fourth row, but disastrous start in uh, the first race from drop pretty much to the back of the field. And then it was catch up from there. It was a much bigger field at Sandown. Finished first race 21st, then made it up to 11th in race two, but really the damage was done 
plain and simple uh, in race number one. Uh, sees him uh, come out of uh, round number one in uh, 12th in the championship. So this is a, a much better performance and much more what we expected to see, uh, uh, particularly after such a strong finish to the season for him late last year. Absolutely. What I am noticing as well is Bradley Packham backs it in to turn number one. The car was just sliding on the rears and he just kept control of it nicely just to make sure the car didn't get away from him. And then he's got Jason Kay all over the rear, which we've actually been told that uh, he is being scored manually at the moment. The car does not appear to have uh, a functioning Dorian timer at the moment, which is the common timing device that all the competitors have to use in all the categories. It's a device you charge up and you mount in the car. Yeah, particularly to as close to the front firewall as you, you possibly can. But uh, for that number 99 machine, that uh, Dorian time appears to have uh, lost its charge. But for the moment, we know where he is. He's glued to the rear of the SCTR entry of Bradley Packham. So, yeah, actually sitting in sixth position, but uh, with no timing. Well, a bit of a lock-up runs wide there. That's uh, very, very costly, and even clouds the curb on the uh, exit as well. But that's certainly uh, costing meterage, that's for certain. A good few car lengths back now. A strange place to lock up because it's quite a low speed entry into a low speed corner. And is that another lock up there as well? So certainly pushing uh, the limits of the car at the moment in uh, car number 99, that's for certain. He definitely is. What I've been noticing as well, Dan, is a lot of the other categories have been using very few curbs around the place. A lot of exit curbs being used. Turn one especially, you see some drivers just want to put a little bit of a tyre just up over the curb just to make sure the car turns in nicely, it sets you up nicely for the next corner which is turn two. A lot of the XL drivers I have noticed have not been doing that in this particular race so far. I'm not sure if that's strategic based on uh, the longevity of the race or if that's just something that they've all observed is not good for the cars. But have a look here as we watch William Sala come into turn number one. See complete avoidance of the turn one curb. I don't know if it's because they're front wheel drive. If you're using the curb at turn number one, you're, you're not steering when you're using the, the curb or bouncing around or whatever. So I don't know if that's a, just a little little trait that's different with a front wheel drive car. I'm uh, speculating there. I'm uh, not a race driver. That's why I'm in here with you. Yeah, that's why we're both up here, actually, because we don't want to be in the cars themselves getting all hot and sweaty. Like been Plenty of drivers coming out of cars this weekend and absolute balls of sweat, but they're enjoying themselves. That's the important thing. It's pretty good, isn't it? Pretty good winter and weather. I mean, I was out there in a T-shirt and a jeans, and I was sweating earlier on, so it really is quite warm here. Uh, cold this morning, but it's turned into a really lovely day, and certainly uh, the heat's got some... some uh, real sharpness to it. We can see the weather displayed by Blendline TV. 18.5 degrees, I can assure you, is a fair bit warmer than that a couple of hours ago. Yeah, it feels a lot warmer than that. We turned up at the track this morning because it was quite cool. It was only an overnight low of 7 degrees. Yes. We all turned up with jackets on. I think we all shedded them in about 5 minutes flat because it was so warm just standing out in the sun. It feels like it's about you know, 22, 23 degrees. So absolutely pristine weather same as what we had last year and even last year we had the round in march and so that was you know 13 months ago we've got identical conditions this time around which has been absolutely fantastic so we're honed in here on a battle a bit further down the order we've got uh, keenan jones pursuing the number 109 machine of richard outram heading down here to turn number 10. This turns a very unusual corner. A lot of people look at it on the map and think, oh, that's an easy corner. But the problem is it's not a 90 degree corner. It's more than 90 degrees. So you have to give it a little bit more patience than you otherwise normally would. Turn number 11 is the same. And I think that's why it produces uh, such a good overtake, particularly down at turn number 11, because you've got to turn that bit sharper. Oh, speaking of uh, turning a bit sharper, that was very, very close there. Uh, car number 87 all over the back of Appledore, and in fact swings it to the inside now, does Morales up the inside. Nice move. Pulls it up nicely as well and holds on to the position. Good racing, good uh, good. Awareness from both drivers there. Appledore's not going to have to be very, very careful. He doesn't open the door here to come join us behind him because there was a very small gap between the two cars after that pass was made and Appledore just got the car wedged into that gap beautifully. Did not leave the door open for a second car to come through, but he's going to have to be careful here as the 87 machine of Morales hopefully will kick away and then leave Appledore to his own private battle for uh, another position that he needs to defend for the next couple of corners. Now, the important th news that came throughout the week with regards to Hyundai Excels is we know that for many, many years they've been a very stable category. Rule set's been very stable. 
Um, there's been some adaptations to the mechanical platform to try and make things a bit more cost effective for people. They got a little bit of bad news in the last couple of weeks that the, uh, the federal RSR tyre that they've used for many, many seasons, unfortunately, is going to have its production discontinued. And that's going to happen around the middle of this year. So there's going to be a bit of a switchover period. Um, where a number of drivers are going to have to switch over to a Dunlop tyre, which is a sort of an equivalent. And there's a tyre tender still going on at the moment for who's going to be the control category supplier for the next couple of seasons. So that was something completely unexpected. It's going to throw a little bit of a spanner in the works with some of the XL racing later in the year because you won't be able to mix tyre sets. You have to use four tyres of the same manufacturer and same compound. Um, and they're going to have to find a way just to sort of look after, uh, I guess, the interests of all the competitors over the next sort of couple of rounds, at least until the end of the year before things get finalised. So that's a bit of an interesting take on something that doesn't usually happen in circuit racing here in, uh, in the state level categories. It's usually at the end of the season, we know we're swapping to another tyre. You don't hear about it happening, you know, middle of the year. Yeah, and from, from what I saw on uh, social media, it certainly caught the category off guard. And yes. as we say, uh, expecting that to uh, play a potential factor come later on in the season. Don't know if that's a lockup or a bit of smoke underneath. I think it is a bit of smoke bit of underneath smoke. the 99 machine. So not only is it uh, lacking... Oh, no, it's not lacking a transponder. It's now appearing on our screen. Yeah, it's been appearing on the screen, but I think they've been scoring it manually for a little while, so they're not too concerned. They've just been ticking it off as it goes along. You know, the old stopwatch is out, and they're clicking it on, going, yep, OK, that's fine. For the moment, it's not been too difficult to task for the timing team to score at the uh, Jason K car manually anyway, because he's been glued to the rear of Bradley Packham for about the last five or six laps. So pretty easy for them to, you know make sure that whenever he goes past he's almost doing a very similar lap time to the car in front of him so not a difficult task by any stretch of the imagination Murray sets his personal best on the last lap you can see he's gaining he's on these two and let's see this time through uh, once again yeah Murray with the uh, fastest lap of those guys a uh, uh, 43-4 the other two 44-2 so eight tenths of a second faster and he's not he's no longer catching he's there he's, he's on these two yeah he's all over him like a cheap suit at the moment he's going to be throwing it up the inside somewhere along the line in the next couple of corners through turn four I think we need to get you some new suits yeah yeah I don't have too many we'll uh, we'll go from We'll go for a shop a bit later on, I think. Thanks. Through turn five, up to now the difficult part of the track at turn six. This is where there's a passing opportunity available if you can make it stick. And Murray's not quite close enough to have a go at Jason K just yet. Uh, we can see them file around. It's really a really impressive performance from Murray. You can see the P plate on the back, new to XL Racing, but really taking it up to uh, some of the uh, regulars of the category, which is really good to see. So, a great performance to be seventh uh, so early on in uh, his XL career. Yeah, it's a very, very early uh, statement of intent, mm. I think, from young Jet Murray there. If he's been able to hang on to some drivers that have been around the traps and driven plenty more races than he has over the last couple of seasons. And yeah, you can see right there, there is nothing in it between these three drivers. One second covers those three cars, and then they're eight seconds in arrears of Harry Tompkins, who's holding down fourth and uh, hasn't really got any competition at the moment. Oh, a little bit awkward there. Might have been a very, very minor amount of nose to tail contact between Packham and Kate as they came through the final corner all trying to get the better exit. Packham knows that he's under threat. James, Jason Kane knows he's under threat too. He's got to get this done because here comes Murray. He took the open door that was left available because the 99 machine of Jason Kane moved over looking for a way around Packham. And that was unfortunately all that it took for Murray to take that position away. So that's great heads up driving from the youngster. Yeah, really, really good move at turn number two there. And Fired out the corner and even looked like he was going to have a look at Packham, but uh, to no avail there, but certainly uh, time's on his side with seven minutes to go. Top five finish very much on the cards. Oh, big correction. Can he save it? Yes, nicely held. And Murray's now all over looking up the inside. Packham, what a save. That was very crossed up. He's run wide, gone in a bit deep, but Murray's got to go the long way at the hairpin now if he wants to make the move. If he can stick there, he might have the inside for turn. Number nine, he is there. He has stuck there. Nice move. 
Packham now the one swinging around the outside. Can he hold it to have the run at turn number 10? No. I think that is Murray now with the position. Moves up to fifth. Brilliant racing between these three on this lap. Oh, in fact, Packham says, no, you don't. Sends it up the inside at turn number 10. Unfortunately, though, it's going to be an awkward exit for him. And that means that Murray should hold on to the position. A bit of contact. A bit of contact on the run to turn number 11. He's done really well there. He's had to do a lot of hard work in this lap. Jet Murray finally consolidates the position at turn 11. That took half a lap to pull off. Had to hold it right around the outside. And he's gone off the circuit. Two left-hand side tyres in the dirt on the backside of turn 12. That doesn't hurt his straightaway speed down the main straight towards turn one. In fact, he's actually increased the margin heading towards turn one. And now the door opens for Jason Kay to go up the inside at turn one on Bradley Packham. Leaves a little bit of space for the SCTR entry at turn number two. And he's finally through as well. Here comes Sala, follows straight through as well. So Packham falling down through the field. No, Packham says, no, 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 no. I'm not losing this position. I'm fighting for it. I'm going around the long way. And does so again at turn number four. So Sala, it looked like he almost had the move done plain sailing, but no. Packham holds on. I don't reckon Bradley Packham saw Sala coming. I think he was too focused on Jason Kay there, having just been past a turn one. He didn't realise that Sala had crept up on them, just like you know a you know just like a, a spider coming to scare little Miss Muffet. He was <laughs> uh, he was right there in a heartbeat. <laughs> and Sala, Sala all over him once again. He's swinging around the outside and Hampin should have the move now because he's got the inside for turn number nine. Very nicely done from Sala, and well done from Packham. Certainly put up a good fight, that's for sure, in the uh, last couple of laps, but pace not quite there as we get towards the closing stages of this race. Maybe got the tyre pressures a bit too high, was strong early, but maybe gone off, not quite sure. But certainly not got the pace he had earlier on in the race. I'm really interested now to see what Murray can do. Now he's got some clear air. What sort of pace does he have? Does he have the pace of the top four? It'd be interesting to see what he can show and uh, how far he'll be up the order tomorrow, potentially. Potentially, yes. So I mean, he's got a long way to go to catch Harry Tompkins. He's got you know, 10 seconds of margin with only four minutes on the clock. So it pretty much is not going to happen unless Harry Tompkins makes a horrible mistake. But this will be an indicator of what his pace is going to be like tomorrow when they start in progressive grid format. But that battle we were just seeing, I don't think it's going to be over between now and the end of the race. The, uh, the William Sala bradley Packham battle is still going to go on for a little bit longer as we hone in on the 747 of Gareth Hodgkiss chasing uh, the number 14 of uh, Conjonus heading down towards turn one. These two have been glued together for a little while now. Conjonus had that contact in turn three I spied earlier in the race and since then he's just dropped backwards and backwards and backwards. So yeah, You've got the witness mark there on the, uh, the front right hand corner of the front bumper bar there as well, just a little black mark there which uh, is from that contact you mentioned as well. Here goes Hodgkiss down the inside, turn three. Job done. That's why the improvements to this part of the circuit were made, to encourage people to have a little bit more of a go and a bit more side-by-side -side racing. And then that's the other reason why they widened turn four as well. So the other car that was being passed had an opportunity to fight back. So that's, of course, one thing that happened here at Winton uh, during the COVID hit years is that they improved that section of the circuit. And uh, we first got a chance to see that in uh, 2021, where uh, a number of drivers found that uh, that was a new addition. And uh, I think it was uh, very much applauded for being the addition that it was. Got a big tick, big tick of approval from any category, any category here from supercars to TCR and everything in between. It really has got a, uh, a big tick of approval from all the categories, just because it does promote uh, much better racing on that section of track. As we see, uh, Ambrose, he, it was pushed early on by Lodge, but has extended that margin lap uh, on lap. So that's now out to 3.2 seconds. And we believe this is, uh, or the leaders have commenced the uh, final lap of the race. They certainly have. And uh, Ambrose, after surviving threats from James Lodge over the course of the opening couple of laps, he has really ridden away to a nice, healthy advantage here. 3.2 seconds last time across the line. And this is going to be sweet for him. First pole and heading towards first victory. And with his father in his corner, he's been a great coach, looking after the car, teaching him all that he knows from his many years in improved production. He's going to be absolutely stoked seeing his young charge on the top step of the podium after this one. Just two corners to go. 
as we see uh, battles aren't done the uh, fight between uh, number 14 and 747 continues further down the field but we look at Cadell Ambrose as he heads into the final section of turns really nice presented machine uh, no dents or bumps on that that's for sure it was a really really clean race for Cadell Ab uh, Ambrose who rounds the final turn and comes to greet the checkered flag his first victory in Hyundai Circuit excels here in Victoria. Lodge comes home in second position, 3.6 seconds behind. And then we wait for Charlie Nash, who rounds out the top three in the Tickford delivery machine. There he goes across the line. It's the third place to Charlie Nash. So he continues his good run of form. He's had uh, some very, very good results over the early part of the season. And there's Harry Tompkins who was about another eight seconds adrift of Nash at the end of the day. And Jet Murray's going to come home for fifth place. He was actually starting to be a little bit quicker than Harry Tompkins over those closing laps. He dropped into the, the 43s by the end of that race. So that was great to see and maybe a sign of things to come for tomorrow's second race. As we see, 14 and 747 still going at it. Conjunis and uh, Odkiss and there he's right there will he have a look into the final turn we saw a bit of uh, action and incidents between uh, Shane Van Gisbergen and Waters there of course last year in supercars but it looks like these two are going to stay the way they are and they do indeed so 12th and 13th at the end of the race yep 12th and 13th men across the line Carly Fleming in uh, 14th place at the moment crossing the line and the last two finishes are going to be the number 380 machine of Keenan Jones and the 109 of Richard Outram and importantly Dan McCarthy all cars that started look like they have finished this race albeit uh, very close to being lapped in the case of, uh, of Outram and Jones but uh, they've all gotten home great to see really positive really positive uh, particularly after there's even a, a couple of cars that rolled over in the first round and caused an early red flag that was a really nice clean affair for the XL so here's the order at the end of race number one Cadell Ambrose will start from uh, first tomorrow after winning that one from Lodge Nash Tompkins Jeff Murray Jason Kay William Sala Bradley Packham Stuart Bruckner and uh, Morales rounding out the top 10 Appledore uh, Conjurnis Hodgkiss, Fleming, Jones and Outram rounding out the 16 driver field in that clean circuit excels race. Yeah, I think you're right. I think he's got some pace in hand still to burn, but he'll probably take a little bit of, uh, a little bit of heart from what happened yesterday, I think, as well, with, uh, with Harry Tompkins and being a bit more fortunate to have gained that, uh, that position to get him into third overall. It's really going to be key for him, I think, over the course of the first two or three laps of this hit out just to see if he can manage to stay with the likes of Lodge and Ambrose. And if so, maybe he's going to have an opportunity toward the end of this race. It's going to be a case of bide your time, right? You've got 20 minutes, bide your time, put yourself in a position where you, you feel comfortable, you're in your rhythm, suss out your opponent, and then start to, you know, to force the issue a little. Start to push the envelope, figure out where you're stronger versus where they're weaker, and then capitalise. So you don't want to need, you don't need to do that right at the beginning of the race, but I think the opening couple of laps will be key. Uh, Murray, brilliant performance on debut yesterday, starting fifth. You can see him just coming up to his grid slot now, the uh, black machine with the gold stripe down the middle. A brilliant, brilliant performance yesterday, as we say, as a rookie made his way through the field so this will be really if he can make a good start it would be interesting to see just what pace he can do in uh, clear air and whether he can match it with the uh, front four the championship contenders be really interesting to see so I'll be looking out for Murray to see yeah, what, what pace he can produce today. Absolutely credit to the XLs as well they've actually gotten on with it on the formation lap not wanting to waste too much more time in this 20 minute race the lights are on for the second race for XLs and out very very quickly so it was a very very short hold for the 16 car field as they set sail towards turn one for the first time in what we expect to be around 10 or 11 laps duration and Ambrose holds shot on the inside from the pole takes full advantage of that fact and stays ahead of James Lodge Harry Tompkins now glued to the rear gearbox or the rear wing rather of 
Charlie Nash. Bit further back, it's uh, Jason Kay. Gone the long way around uh, Jet Murray, so he's gained a spot with Murray now having to play defensive from Will Sala. Yeah, Sala certainly all over the tail early in this one. Of course, Murray only second start in an XL race, so you can't expect perfection that early on, but not, not, a, not a bad start, nothing to be uh, sniffed at. It was around turn one and two, the placement where uh, Kay managed to make his way past. Oh, contact, there's a few off. Oh, there, there is. The sweeper, there's at least four or five cars involved in that. I just saw a car facing backwards and a bit like NASCAR, all other cars were involved uh, in the action there as well. And there is some damage to uh, car number 14. Yep. And we've got uh, uh, Conjonis and it looks like Will Sala. Yes, it, it is. is. Yes. So Sala in the 36 and the 14 machine there as well of uh, Tree and Conjonis. So they've come together. Safety car deployed, unsurprisingly. Safety car deployed, right decision. Those two cars are going absolutely nowhere. That, I was looking very, very carefully at that part of the track there, McCarthy, because that's where all the uh, the dust is going to have been from picking up that oil spill. So drivers would have been having to sight where they would have sighted where it was on the formation lap, but they wouldn't have had a true feel for just how much grip was there if the car was going to sort of slide up into that sort of speedy dry or what was going to happen. And I think maybe a couple of drivers might have been caught out. Yeah, I think, I think that is the cause of that incident, an unfortunate way to start this one. We said all 16 finishes yesterday is a really nice, clean race, but unfortunately uh, not to be in uh, the second XL race. Quite a bit of uh, damage to the front end of the, the uh, number 14 machine, as you say. That's uh, con, uh, conjunis, so hopefully uh, that can be repaired for the uh, race this afternoon. An interesting uh, Sala, who was in a completely separate you know, in terms of field spread, he was towards the front of the field. Sala um, being collected, I assume. So, yeah, I mean, it really did involve much of that field, that's for certain. Well, Sala had moved his way up into sixth place. He'd moved up ahead of... Uh, he was actually trying to make a pass, I think, on Jet Murray there, who'd gone back one mm. spot. So he was in that sort of group with Murray and Packham and Stuart Bruckner. So I'm wondering if there's maybe been some incidental contact happen a bit further up the field, because you look at the number 14... Uh, of Conjonis and he actually started out 12th so perhaps he's sort of come along and been a bit of an innocent bystander or maybe not been able to react to something that's happened ahead of him so we haven't doesn't appear like we have a replay of that just yet might be difficult to pick up because it happened very late in the piece um, so we'll wait to see if we've got any more details on that particular incident but it uh, looks like the drivers are out of the cars. So that's the, that's the first positive sign, isn't it, Dan McCarthy? The first thing that you always want to see is the drivers are out of the cars and uh, they're walking away from the incident. Looking at the uh, grid sheet compared to the current order, it looks like everybody's pretty much still in position. They've just moved up either one or two places. So it's not actually been that much reshuffling of the pack. It just seems that somehow these two have found themselves together. Maybe Sala lost it a little bit, came back on the track. I'm, I'm not sure, I'm entirely uh, speculating there, but it's just interesting that at different ends of the field, well, there we go. We're getting a little bit of word through from some of the camera points that uh, it looks like Will Sala had a little bit of a moment all on his own. And as a number of cars tried to avoid the incident, several of them got through and it uh, looks like uh, Conjonis did not get through. Now, the question is, what has he made contact with on the front of that car? Because I can't see any real visible damage on the number 36 machine of Sala from this angle, unless it's something on the other side. The only thing that's obviously the giveaway is the uh, the wheels are pointing towards the right-hand side, but it looks like the car's turned. There's a little bit of damage here. Yeah, there it is, right on the, on the left rear corner of the, uh, the Roadworthy Shop number 36 machine. But that sort of damage doesn't sort of really match up really at the moment no. with the damage on the front of that car, does it? Have they maybe made contact with the Marshall Post? Oh, potentially. Potentially that could be the case. And I'm looking solid just around the wheel. That's just where that uh, marshal is now. It looks like might be a bit of damage in there as well. So it's certainly in that uh, left corner anyway. That is for certain. Well, the marshal post is actually on the opposite side of the, uh, the racetrack as well. So that would uh, probably suggest that they haven't made contact with there. But uh, maybe it looks worse than it actually is. One of the uh, one of the things I, I get from that is the fact, Sala, if that is true, from what we're hearing, our cameramen, they're spinning across the track. It's it's very lucky that only one got involved. So we've got to say we've got to say a great job for the uh, rest of the drivers to avoid uh, the spinning machine. So yeah, to only have two involved when a car that far up the field is spun in front of the pack, it's that's a pretty good job for the rest of the field to uh, take avoiding action. Yeah, you're not wrong. Just getting some confirmation. We unfortunately don't have a replay of that incident. So. 
the, I guess the stewards will be taking a look at the, uh, the old GoPros that are attached on the roll bars and uh, inside the cockpit of the, the cars concerned and probably from the cars that were uh, behind the incident as well to deduce anything that may need reviewing out of that one. So the only changes that have really happened from the start is uh, Jason Kay has gone up one spot. So he's the fifth car in the queue there, the other number 99 machine uh, ahead of Jet Murray in the 158. Apart from that, everybody else is virtually in the, the same order, uh, aside from the two cars that have dropped to the, the back of the field. Five second penalty just appeared on our screen Jay. for Kay. So. That'll be for a jump start. I'm sure that's going to be for a jump start. That's normally the penalty that gets handed out. It's either five or ten seconds. We've seen that quite a bit early in the first two rounds of the Victorian State Circuit Racing Series this year, haven't we? Uh, improved production we saw in uh, two races last round, uh, people getting uh, jump start penalties. So very interesting that so many have, have popped up in the first couple of rounds. Yeah, well, Sandown was a bit of an unusual one. I think it was uh, Danny Timewell and Ian McLennan in improved production in two separate races. They were done just sort of for, they were just rolling at the start. You know, they, of course, have got a, uh, you know, line lockers and the clutches. And when you start to come off them, you know, you really can't just put it back in again. Hyundai Excels don't have that sort of feature. You know, you've got your three pedals, you've got your clutch, your accelerator and your brake. And, you know, the minute you start to try and it's that balancing point, isn't it? When you're taking the clutch up to the bite point and you've got the accelerator at the point for launch and you just got to hold it and hold it and hold it. And it it's a difficult thing with two feet, isn't it, to find that thing? And Jason's probably just let it out a little bit fractionally too early. Yeah, it appears to be the case. Great job from our recovery team and uh, Marshall's quickly on the scene and quickly taking the cars oh, off the circuit as we can quite see. Heavy. Yeah, it certainly does. Good to see a, a good crowd of people here uh, today. Certainly uh, coming in there they are. You can see them uh, just by the uh, cafe there on the exit of turn number two. Great to see a, a good group of people here this weekend as part of the uh, second round of the Triple Eight Home Loans Victorian State Race Series. You're watching the uh, coverage on Blendline TV. Uh, great images supplied as always from the team. So, yeah, brilliant to see uh, numbers continue to build. At Winton's a difficult one. It's a bit of a travel from Melbourne. Uh, not so many people come out to this round normally, but we've seen a good field, good entrance in all the categories for Winton, and we expect to build on that when we go back to the more traditional tracks of Phillip Island and Sandown. Yeah, you're spot on there. And on top of that, you look at the uh, the amount of categories we had at Sandown. We had 10 all up. We still had, had HQ Holdens mm. were out there as well. Uh, and the other category, I think, just that we were missing there, just escapes my memory for the moment. Historic touring Historic cars. Historic touring cars, thank you very much. And uh, they sort of only do select rounds. That's the, the piece of the puzzle. Same with the MG Car Club. They usually do the first three rounds of the championship, uh, and then they skip four and five. So it tends to be a few gaps where we have some categories of maybe, you know, eight categories as opposed to ten categories. You can see there we've already been through Sandown about uh, a month and a half ago. Uh, it's only five weeks until we go to Phillip Island for the Pyark round at uh, the 26th to the 28th of May. And there's, then there's a bit of a gap. There's a uh, quite a substantial gap to, from May through to August when we go back to uh, Sandown, the event put on by the Australian Sports Sedan Association of Victoria. And then the, the Vic Mini Club putting on the round on the, the 22nd to the 24th of September. And still the asterisks over Calder Park just yet. Don't know which of the clubs is going to be putting that round together if it goes ahead, uh, but it might be an, a sort of a combination round compared, uh, similar to what they do up here, where all the clubs sort of get together that uh, run the Vic State Series and they put on, they supply you know staff from each of the groups and then they all get together and put that event on. Now, I guess the word that I heard with regards to Calder Park is it sounds like, from a Motorsport Australia perspective, that uh, Calder are sort of very receptive to making all the necessary changes to the circuit, the safety improvements and all those sorts of things that need to be done in time to race. It's just going to be a matter of time, whether they can get it done in time. Correct. That's that's the thing. Yeah, exactly. Calder are doing everything they can to get it done. It's just a case of if they will meet the deadline, and there are a couple of deadlines they have to meet before that uh, event can take place. Good news for you watching at home and at the racetrack. We are set to go green once again at the end of this lap. Safety car scheduled to enter the lane. We've got 14 cars left on the racetrack. There'll be about six minutes to go when we uh, hit the start-finish straight. So uh, still a good portion of racing and a lot can change in that time. Absolutely. Now, safety car restart procedure is going to be very, very important here. So you can see a number of drivers already starting to get some heat in the tyres. They don't want to lose all that tyre temperature. 
The safety car pulls away from the field and uh, Cadell Ambrose, this will be, I guess, his first safety car restart procedure. So he's got to get this right. There's no passing or overlapping before the control line. And you don't want your opponent to get away from you. So you want to keep a nice tight formation just like this. This is what we've seen in many categories over the, the course of time. You know, Formula Vs restarting in a big pack formation. You want to be nice and tight. Don't want to be caught sleeping at the wheel. Yeah, that's for sure. It just looks like a crawl, doesn't it? It'll almost pit lane speed down the uh, back straight. Shows how long that straight is actually uh, down in two turn. Number 11 and 12, look at these top three. Line of stern, Go Ambrose on. goes before the final turn, puts his foot down, turns that in nicely. Really good, mature restart there from the young Cadell Ambrose, and he'll have a little bit of a margin down into turn number one. Lodge uh, made a nice exit out of turn number 12, and he's slightly gap Nash there as well. Great restart from Cadell Ambrose. Lodge also didn't let him get away either, so he realised as soon as he was going that he needed to go too, did precisely that. So. Nice tight group of four or five cars heading down towards turn number three at the moment. You've got uh, Bradley Packham in the one 2 four machine here. And Stuart Bruckner tucked in behind as well. So these guys have benefited, unfortunately, from William Sala's off uh, at turn number five. Now we've got to get through turn five again. So it's been a little while since they've gone through here at racing speed. Do they all manage to get through this time? It all looks pretty good so far. Bit tiptoey, I reckon. Tompkins didn't take that at full commitment, I don't reckon. Here comes Jet Murray. Murray up the inside of Kay. Nice move. Room given from both drivers. And uh, Kay holds on by the uh, skin of his teeth. But, of course, Kay has that five-second penalty hanging over his head as well. Yeah, because it's a tight field here as well, that five-second penalty is a real kick in the guts too. You want to try and get away. You want to try and put some distance between the people that you're battling with and yourself because every little you know, extra metre of racetrack you can make is going to be beneficial for you when you get to the control line at the chequered flag. Of course, uh, that was quite obvious at uh, the Australian Grand Prix, wasn't it, when Carlos Sainz got his five-second penalty? Served under safety car, no points, Carlos. Mm, that's exactly right because of the, how the close confines of the field when they all cross the line. So Murray finally consolidates that move at turn number 11. But Kay's not letting him off the hook just yet little bit of maybe Morse code in the rear bumper there. Maybe a little bit too much because Murray was very wide at the last corner and dropped two wheels in the dirt. Yeah, managed to uh, keep the momentum up though, which is really good. So he's pulled away from K on the straight. And down in turn one, yes, as you say, consolidated the move, made it stick. And he's right on the back of uh, Tompkins as well. So all to play for, for fourth position. Tompkins, the series leader, not able to get away from the uh, chasing group at the moment. And he's losing time on the three marching ahead. It's Ambrose by seven tenths from Lodge. Nash just over a second behind the number 39 machine. Yeah. And there is the big group that we are looking at on the screen. One, two, three, four, five, six cars, all line astern into the sweeper. Oh, it's off, it's Lodge, Lodge, Lodge is off, off the road. He is off and he's gonna lose a spot here to Charlie Nash, there he goes. So that's the mistake that uh, Charlie was hoping for. Not, I guess, in that sort of, uh, those circumstances for Lodge. It would have been a case of, uh, Charlie was probably hoping that he could go with the top two runners and he was just starting to lose touch with them. So that's a, a real free kick for him. And Murray now thinks that Tompkins is being the, uh, the cork and the champagne bottle here. He would like position number four if he can. That's a big surprise for me. Harry Tompkins not being able to go with the leaders. Yeah, they're very interesting. As, you, as we said, championship leader coming into this race. And uh, his series rival is out in front. And now with quite a margin after the uh, mistake there by Lodge. I think Lodge is just pushing really, really hard to try and keep up with Ambrose. And unfortunately, yeah, just couldn't keep with the pace. Made an unforced error and lose his second position. Now it's Murray coming under threat once again from K around the final sequence of turns. Is there another nudge? No, I don't think so. I think, uh, I think uh, Murray's just understeering through that final turn. Is that a bit of smoke coming out the back of K? Fingers crossed that's uh, nothing terminal. As they cross the line, two minutes on the clock. Murray's going to have to go defensive. K will try and swing it around the long way to give him the inside of turn number two, but to no avail there. And number one, two, four, that's Packham. He's sitting there watching, hoping for a mistake. Let's have a look what happened to James Lodge up through the sweeper. So he, he just lost the rear, so he was gone on his own. He was a little bit too wide. He was offline for turn number five, and that's all it took for Charlie Nash to put the ticket entry up into position number two. So self-inflicted for James Lodge. He's not going to let Nash get away. He's right with him 
down at turn six and seven at the moment. Nash holds for the moment. Here comes Harry Tompkins. He's just got a few extra metres now on Jet Murray. Here comes Packham down the inside of Kay. Sees a gap, wants to take the gap. Just a little bit of minor contact there with Jason Kay. And now there's no room on the other side of turn eight. Just move the car over. Take the defensive approach. Take the opportunity away. That's how you defend through turn nine. Uh, while we're looking at this, I just saw another car go off at uh, the sweeper. So I think it's all that cement dust that's gone down to try and clean up the oil from the MG. So if more, uh, more dust and dirt was kicked up as another car goes off the track. So that's really been a hot spot throughout this race. And as I look on the timing screen, Morales now with a five-second penalty. Bruckner now with a five-second penalty. So this five-second penalty is appearing left, right and centre on the uh, left-hand side of the screen. So, uh, yeah, it's going to be interesting. Maybe safety car infringement uh, on the restart. Oh, as we see, the uh, checkered flag. Flags out. Ambrose taking his second race victory. And uh, in doing so, with a championship leader, or not now, um, Lodge coming across the line in fourth position. That will be a change for the championship lead. Ambrose moving to the top. So it's Ambrose from Nash. Lodge in third. Make him coming home in fourth position. Oh, it's Harry Tompkins, actually, so that uh, uh, graphic's a little yeah, bit uh, out of date, unfortunately. Yes. And then you've got uh, Jet Murray's going to come home for fifth. Jason Kay's crossed the line in sixth place. So uh, then Bradley Packham from Stuart Bruckner, uh, and then Cisco Morales, and Scott Appledore's inside the 10. So there's going to be a few drivers that are going to move up the order here after those penalties have been applied. On with you, I think those other couple of five-second penalties may have been for a... Uh, a safety car restart infringement. Maybe they weren't uh, following correctly or maybe they've been out of line or overlap at the control line. We're not quite sure because we didn't see those, but that's probably what logic would dictate. So the trick trailers, Hyundai Excels have finished. Cadell Ambrose, another race win at the end of the day. And Charlie Nash, 4.2 seconds in arrears, just holding off the advances of James Lodge by two tenths of a second right to the line there. Number three fourth uh, place car there is actually uh, Harry Tompkins, so I'm sure the guys downstairs will fix that graphic up for the next time around. From Jet Murray, Jason Kay, Bradley Packham, Stuart Bruckner, Cisco Morales and Scott Appledore. Of course, there's a couple of five-second penalties to come in that one, so we'll wait to see those applied post-race. Keenan Jones, Richard Outram, Carly Fleming and Gareth Hodgkiss uh, finishing the race there. And a couple of extra DNFs I think you're pointing out there. looks like uh, Hodgkiss may have DNFed on the last lap, so. Yes, yes, it appears so, yeah, showing uh, one lap down and a DNF next to the name, so didn't cross the line at the end of that race, so uh, only 13 finishes in that one, a baker's dozen. Welcome back to the uh, second round of the Victorian State Circuit Racing Championships brought to us this year by Triple Eight Home Loans. So, uh, final race of the weekend, Hyundai XLs had some fantastic racing in the first two. I'm sure this one will be much the same. The feature race is ahead of us. Steve DeFries, thanks once again for joining me in the box. Should be a good one. Absolutely, Dan. We're looking forward to this one. It's been two action-packed races so far for Hyundai XLs. Sadly, the first race today for the XLs involved a, a pretty nasty-looking incident uh, for the number 14 of uh, Trajan Con uh, Jonas, but uh, that car, we believe, has gone home. Damage a bit too severe to be repaired here at the circuit, so won't be contesting the final race of the weekend. But uh, I'm not sure how William Sale has fared getting uh, his number 36 machine up and running, but uh, I'm looking for the red car, and I'm not sure, is that it on? That's not, I don't think that's no. it on the back of the grid there. I think that uh, P-plate on the back of that car there um, is for a different one because uh, Salah's car is red and it's pretty easy to spot when you're out there. I don't think Hodgkiss is out there either, potentially. The bright yellow machine, so, uh, yeah, no. Uh, so, yeah, I don't think Hodgkiss is out there in this one. So a slightly depleted field of XLs for this final race, but what we've seen so far is, uh, yeah, some great racing in this one. This is how they line up. Cadell Ambrose, two out of two so far this weekend, looking for the clean sweep in this one. Charlie Nash and James Lodge have had a second and a third apiece. They are equal on points for the round coming into this final race. Harry Tompkins, a consistent round so far, two fourth places. Lost the championship lead to Ambrose in the last race, but the gap, just a uh, couple of points coming into this one. It really is those four that are the title contenders this year. Jet Murray, rookie this weekend. 
Set the world alight, two fifth places. Brilliant uh, performance from Jet so far this weekend. Head of Bradley Packham, Jason Kay, and the uh, beautifully presented Stuart Bruckner XL. You got Scott Appledore in the uh, the iconic livery uh, from the Tiranas of the 70s there, the 32 machine going through the shot for ahead of Cisco Morales. Then Keenan Jones and Richard Outram, they are definitely both out there. And then the last car that we can see there is Carly Fleming in the 142. So only 13 starters here. So you called it correctly. Gareth Hodgkiss in the, the 747 Racing Money Quest machine is missing. William Sala in the Roadworthy Shop number 36 is missing. And of course, uh, Con Jonas was the car that had the bumper hanging off and uh, pretty severe uh, indentation on the bonnet as well. So damage too severe to repair there. So slight Slightly depleted field, 13 out of the 16 runners that we started with at the weekend have made it to the final fling here at Winton Motor Raceway. Here's the uh, calendar, of, as we say, final round, uh, final race for the round here at Winton. Uh, so not too long till the next round. Phillip Island first hit out there for the year, May 26 to 28. Then a bit of a gap, we missed the cold, horrible Melbourne weather in uh, June and July and come back towards the end of winter, August 11 to 13, down at Sandown Motor Raceway in the heart of Victoria, uh, in the heart of Melbourne as well, of course. Uh, beyond that, the final round, certain final round, Phillip Island, September 22 to 24, and then the TBC, the 2B confirmed event at Calder, October 27, 29. Not sure if we're going to make it there. It's been a lot of talk, uh, essentially, the venue's doing everything they can in their power to uh, get to the event there later on in the year. It's whether or not the, they can meet the deadlines that uh, have been outlined to them. So cars forming up on the grid here with Ambrose on the pole again. So he had the pole and he has taken both the race wins so far this weekend. So effectively in, uh, in Formula One terms, they would, uh, if he had the fastest lap of the weekend as well, they would call that the Grand Schlem. Uh, yes. I've always tried to work out there's the Grand Slam and the Grand Schlem, but um, in the case of this one, it'd be a, we would just call it a perfect weekend. Three, perfect three, weekend. three wins, maximum <laughs> points, pole position. You really can't do much more than that. No, so uh, 194, Ambrose on the right-hand side, and Charlie Nash, son of Rod Nash, Tickford owner, hence the uh, Tickford delivery on the left-hand side. Both of these two brilliant young kids that really do have a career in motorsport. Watch for these names in coming years. This should be a great battle between the two of them. And then two of the title contenders as well on the second row, Lodge and Tompkins. And we're away, and it's Ambrose with the jump. Great initial launch, and will comfortably lead into turn number one. Nash is bogged down and both Tompkins and Lodge will swing by and in fact Tompkins goes from fourth to second. Brilliant start there on the outside. Nicely done and I think Nash may even come under a little bit of pressure for, uh, from behind from Murray who's all over his tail down into turn number three for the first time. Yeah, he certainly did get the best of the front row start there. Charlie Nash is definitely a little bit tardy and it's more like it from Harry Tompkins, it's the sort of Harry Tompkins we're used to seeing in several of the uh, events gone by. And he's uh, always been at the front of the field, but uh, he likes to be out in front. And that's a bit more of a, like we're used to seeing him start the Hyundai XL off the grid. I was about to say, before the race start there, the, the two front row starters in Cadell Ambrose and uh, Charlie Nash, they've spent quite a lot of their, uh, their childhood years battling against each other in karting. So they know each other very, very well. And uh, probably the first time that they would have started alongside each other on the front row of a race in a very, very long time. So I was interested just to see how they went into turn one together. They both sort of got that jump initially where they reacted to the lights almost identically. Just a different phase to start. There's a massive flat spot going to end up on one of the tyres on Cadell Ambrose's car after that. Looked like the uh, front left from our point of view, so yeah, it might have to uh, nurse that one. But as you said earlier on in the weekend, Tompkins uh, has been nursing a flat spot after making it to the grid with the tyre not even turning. So the massive flat spot on uh, one of his tyres, that was uh, before race one even commenced. So he's been on the back foot from there, but Tompkins collecting the points as he uh, has done all season long. Two thirds and then three fourths to this point and uh, currently up in second position. That's how you build a championship, isn't it? Just consistency, that's all it is. Got to, first of all, you've got to worry about finishing. That's the old adage, isn't it? In order to finish first, first you must finish. So that's the first tick box you have to tick off on any racing 
activity. Doesn't matter whether you're a starting out or whether you're a veteran, you've got to finish the race to have any hope of being on the top step of the podium. Then when you start finishing races, then you can start to build you know your momentum. You start to pick up extra positions here and there and slowly start to inch your way towards the front. That's, as you said, is how you build the championships, through consistency and through just keeping the car on the road. Looks like it is on for second position and there it is just at the uh, bottom of the shot but it looks like Nash already is uh, stopped looking behind in the mirror and he is looking ahead trying to catch up with the two cars ahead of him. Uh, the Tompkins and Lodge combination battling all the way down the field. This is the battle for seventh position between K and uh, Bruckner, car number 99 and car number two. Now uh, that number 99 machine, that's actually a spare car. Here's one of the cars that... Uh, Notably rolled at Sandown. I'm not sure if you are tuned into the coverage of uh, Blend Line TV, but if you did, you may recall a uh, Hyundai XL, one of two barrel rolling uh, across the gravel trap. So had to take the spare car, uh, K this weekend, that uh, orange machine. Yes, absolutely. That was uh, pretty frightening as a pair of rollovers. Uh, you know, I think it was race two of the yes, weekend, yep. uh, and they rolled over at turn one, so definitely one of the spare cars had to be out, and uh, showing no ill effects of that. That's the important thing, isn't it? He's just back in the car, got on with business, uh, no unintended side effects, and uh, the car is still very, very competitive, even though it is a spare car. A little bit further ahead of that uh, little battle group of three just there with uh, Bradley Packham, Jason Kay and Stuart Bruckner. Uh, Jet Murray had done a very, very nice job to keep the pressure up on young Charlie Nash for the first lap and a half. And now Charlie's just starting to open the taps a little bit, just starting to try and edge away, trying to break the back of Murray and uh, try and, as you said, play catch up to, uh, to Tompkins and Lodge. Ambrose. Initially straight away, pulled a margin, fastest lap on lap number two. Margin immediately out to two seconds from the uh, chasing pack. So he's uh, got his head down early, tried to pull a margin. He said uh, after race number one, uh, when I saw him uh, earlier this morning, he said, yeah, that's the target again this afternoon. Just want to make a great start and uh, get away from the uh, chasing pack. And he's very much done that in the early couple of laps. As the fighting continues, look at these guys cocking up a wheel around uh, turn number eight and into turn number nine. They'll be doing the same, but with the right-hand side. And here we are, Fleming up the inside of car number 109. That is uh, Ultram. So a good move there, nice clean move. And uh, no noticeably, a spoiler on that car that you uh, don't see on the other machines. Quite, quite visible, quite plain and clear to see a, a spoiler on the back of the 142 machine. Well, there's actually a spoiler on the back of uh, the 109 there of Outram too. So again, it's very, you said, very rare to see the Hyundai XL sporting a spoiler. The one on the, the blue car, the second one in the queue is actually a factory spoiler that uh, you had as a factory option if you bought that car brand new. And then the one that's on the 142 machine just ahead belonging to Carly Fleming. I actually believe that's a rally type spoiler or it's a, a special package spoiler that you could buy like as a body kit, as a, a complete you know, accessory for that car. As we see it change for position here, Lodge slices his way through underneath Tompkins at turn number one and two. Knowledge, your knowledge of Excels is impeccable. Very, very nice. <laughs> I used to have the big sister, which was the, uh, I guess, deemed to be the Hyundai Accent. That was my first car, and they were the sort of the, had the same sort of body style packaging that you could uh, get back in the day. The uh, the Excel was the, I guess, the start, and then the Accent was the evolution of uh, cars that came after that around the 2000s. Yes, yes. Very, very good, very knowledgeable. Far over my head, I'll be <laughs> honest with you, as we see Tompkins and Lodge continue to fight. So although Lodge has taken second, Tompkins is sticking with him early on here. 15 minutes to go, of course, five minutes extra in this final feature race. A few extra points on the line, 30 for race wins uh, in the race earlier today and yesterday, but 40 points for the feature race and an additional five minutes compared to what we saw earlier. 25 minutes on the clock and already we're uh, 10 minutes in, flown by. Yeah, absolutely. Bolted by at the moment. We've uh, clocked up three and three quarter laps. Count Cadell Ambrose currently working his fourth lap, keeping an eye out also on the track record. His best lap at the moment is about half a second in arrears of that record. Jared Farrell setting that record 13 months ago. So 1 minute 41.17 is the track record. And Cadell Ambrose at the moment, 1 minute 41.6. So not too shabby. 
No, and uh, if you look down at the uh, lap record set a couple of years ago by uh, Jared Farrell, just a couple, just uh, half a second away from that. So we've been uh, pretty fast this weekend, as you say, although uh, smaller in numbers, certainly uh, not uh, short of talent and uh, expertise and real race craft on the grid. That is for sure, as we're yeah, only half a second off the lap record. And with UV the way it is this weekend, a lot of drivers have been saying how slippery the track is. Uh, you know, that's a really good effort. Absolutely. When the weather was very, very similar uh, this weekend compared to what it was 13 months ago, we were up here for the second round of the Victorian State Circuit Racing Championships again. As we continue to watch this battle, this battle's been glued um, front bumper to rear bumper pretty much all weekend, hasn't it? Bradley Packham and Jason Kate, and, uh, and they drag the likes of Stuart Bruckner, and in some occasions, Jet Murray's been involved in this as well. So this has been, I guess, the highlight for me, how close these two have kept they're running throughout all three races across the weekend. They've changed positions a few times, haven't they? All, all of these guys and oh, ranging right up there, almost contact, setting up the move at turn number nine, but to no avail. No room there. You've got to have a bit of a cooperation from the uh, other driver to allow some space there, but uh, I don't think it was quite close enough. It would have certainly been a lunge had he attempted that one. He's having a little bit of a look and a bit of a lock-up as a result. A bit of a late change. Oh, and no, I'm not going to go for it. Or is that actual smoke coming out? I'm not entirely sure. Well, it looked I've a noticed, little smoky mid-corner. I've noticed plenty of drivers going on from that uh, rear shot, from sort of turn 8, turn 9, coming down the straight to turn 10, watching the cars from the rear. Several of them have been having similar sort of smoke a mitt from the back of the car so I don't know if it's a little bit of tyre locking maybe a little bit of uh, I guess of oil or something maybe just slightly spilling over touching the headers inside the car just putting a little bit of smoke out I don't think it's too severe I mean if you notice you, you can tell when a tyre locks up pretty drastically because there's smoke for days although he is slowing on the straight just as we talk about him mm. so maybe that is a little bit more terminal unfortunately so falls behind uh, Bruckner and also the uh, number 87 machine that is uh, Morales as well so yes certainly uh, not completely coming to a halt or anything but certainly uh, slowed down that's for certain you know what we were talking about spoilers before the more I look at these cars the more I'm noticing that spoilers. a lot of them yeah. actually have them but which small it was the, the big the one that really uh, stood out to my attention yes. that's right yeah a lot of them have got the little low-lying spoiler on there the factory one which uh, as I said for a number of years you go through the XL field here in Victoria and none of them would have it it's aerodynamics at Winton <laughs> is it is it really? <laughs> no, no, definitely no. not. <laughs> definitely not. But uh, as we look at the uh, continuing battle, these two cars are really nicely presented. Nice, clean, very, uh, very clean. N n no bumps, no dents on these two machines in particular. They really do stand out and look the part, don't they? The Bruckner, the Bruckner one always looks like it has like cat eyes on the front of it as well because yeah. it's got the yellow headlamps and just like a couple of little black sort of vertical stripes in there. It makes you, you know, it's an old, uh, they say it's like the green eyed monster type. Uh, thing we've seen in uh, in supercars with lounge before we look at this one here as it comes along it's just looking like there's two little eyes just sort of you know staring back at you we do have a uh, green eyed tribute livery out there this weekend uh, the intake car in saloon cars yes, that is do. actually a very much a nod to uh, that machine driven by Craig Lowndes in the uh, early noughties. There we had one in proof production for a couple of years as well with Stuart Dearden in the uh, the EA Falcon with the barra under the bonnet yes, as well so he yeah. was doing his best in, uh, I guess impersonation of that in uh, his own sort of tasteful way Ambrose got the lead out now to 3.8 seconds and it's also separated between Lodge and Tompkins. Lodge now extending that margin to a second. It was nowhere near that on the uh, previous lap. And yeah, I uh, always CK peel into the pit lane. Uh, so unfortunately we saw the 99 machine, the orange car slow down on pit straight. The uh, lap prone has brought that into the lane. That's a shame because uh, in a race like this, particularly in a feature race, only 13 cars, points going down to the top 20. Some really good points are on the line just for finishing. Absolutely. So looking at the points for the round as they sit right now, Cadell Ambrose out in front. He's uh, got a clean set of heels at the moment. 3.8 seconds the advantage. He would take home the maximum 100 points available for the weekend. James Lodge would be second with 90 points. And then at the moment, with Charlie Nash being in fourth place behind Harry Tompkins, that would be enough. He would best Tompkins by three points overall for the round. And what would that close the margins up to in the uh, in the state championship, though? Because we 
did say it was fairly tight after race one yesterday that a lot of drivers had moved forward, especially with two of the top title protagonists not being here. Well, if it stays the way it is, and that's a big if in motor racing, particularly with 10 minutes to go in, in, a, in an XL race, uh, Cadell Ambrose would extend the margin to 10 points over Tompkins, and uh, Lodge would be a further 14 back. So top three separated by 24 points, and then a bit of a gap back further to Charlie Nash. As we see the cars come around the uh, final turn for one more time, fastest lap of the race once again by Ambrose continuing to chip out that margin uh, half a second, sorry, six tenths faster than anybody else on that last lap. And that includes Lodge in second, who set his personal best on the previous lap of the race. So really good stuff out front from the young fella. Yeah, he's just lowered his fastest lap by a full two tenths of a second. So he's still three tenths of a second away from Jared Farrell's lap record from last year. And Farrell having moved on to, uh, to bigger and better things, a stepping stone from XL. He's, I think he's moved up into a Formula Ford, done a couple of rounds there as well. So this has proved to be one of the best stepping stones into many other forms of motorsport in recent years, hasn't it? You look at uh, Jalen Robotham yep. moving up into a doing, uh, I think it was uh, Trans Am in uh, Thailand for a little while, then into Super 3, Super 2. And I think he's actually gone back overseas again as well to this do weekend. more work in, in Thailand as well. So he's yeah. racing again. He's seen uh, the likes, I think, of was it Jordan Cini, I think, has come through here as well. And uh, a number of other drivers have sort of found their home in XLs. And then it's sort of been a feeder category people look at and go, wow, there's some of these guys are really talented. It's a big one for me, Declan Fraser as yes. well in recent years. He did a lot of XL racing. Then you see the likes of Brock Feeney and Brody Kostecki do They're occasional uh, endurance races up in Queensland, XL endurance races. That's one of the cool things about XLs. You take your XL, race it in Victoria on a weekend off, go up to Queensland and race it over there against people like Proc Feeney and Brody Kostecki. I mean, how cool is that? Mm. And I think the Winton Enduro down here uh, a little bit later in the year uh, has been a very, very popular event in years it gone has. past as well. I've seen uh, you know, people like Jake Rowe teaming up uh, with, I think it was Ben Grice one year, and uh, they had a really, really good run. And uh, several other drivers from several other categories, they really sort of look at it and go, you know what, we're good mates with a lot of these people that we've raced with over the course of our careers. And and they team up and they have an outstanding weekend. Yeah, it really, really is good. And Lodge continuing to extend the margin. There's Murray just going through the bottom of the screen in fifth. Really, really been impressed in his rookie rookie round. Three fifth place finishes. Fingers crossed with uh, seven minutes to go. This is the uh, uh, big highest placed battle. Trying to get it out uh, for sixth position between uh, Packham. Oh, so it's a bit further behind. It's uh, Bruca and uh, Morales. So this is the battle for seventh position. Yeah, this is the battle that's been raging on all race long between uh, Packham, Bruckner and Morales ever since uh, Jason Kay uh, unfortunately dropped out of the battle group. And as we said, he's been in the pit lane for, uh, for a good couple of laps now. So it looks like the issues with the, the spare number 99 chassis appear to be terminal. And that was quite a shame because he was doing very, very well coming into... Uh, the third race. He's, uh, what was his point score there? He had 46 points, so he was actually right up there in the thick of the fight and had accrued, uh, was it a sixth and a seventh place finish on the uh, for the two races that he had undertaken so far for the weekend. So he was looking set for another top six finish. Yeah, it's been, been uh, very impressive uh, out there. Sorry, uh, just a bit distracted there by this battle on the screen at the moment, the 142 of Fleming and Jones. And there's that spoiler that we were talking about just before. Different lines here as well. Look at the, uh, the, the very, very, looking for the very late apex for Carly Fleming. And then I guess the more traditional line there from Jones sort of sticking to the inside and sort of just following the, uh, the natural curvature of the, of the turn and staying nice and close to the apex. That's usually a defensive line, although you've got the inside of the curb there at turn 10, which you typically don't want to do. No, no, particularly uh, in these cars. I see some cars using quite a bit of curb. Saloon cars, they uh, grab an awful lot of curb, but uh, these cars generally stay away from it. Yeah, well, the suspension package in the XLs has sort of been standardised over the last couple of years mm. as well, so it's kept that... Uh, platform fairly standard and constant across all the cars. I think a number of drivers have worked out that it responds better at some circuits than at others. Like, you know, at Sandown, you're forced to use, you know, curbs at turn two and three. And 
uh, you know, Dandenong Road and so on and so forth. Here at uh, Winton, we see a lot of curb use, primarily down here at turn number one. Just a little bit of curb, not too much. You don't want to use the curb at turn two because if you get it wrong and you're carrying a bit too much speed, it'll feed you into that fence that's, that's right. just waiting for you on the outside of the turn. Primarily, you see people use the exit curbs more often here uh, at Winton Motor Raceway than you do see them use the inside curbs because a lot of the exit curbs traditionally are flat. Yes, yes. Uh, there weren't so much until a couple of years ago when they redid a few of the corners. We've spoken about it earlier on in the weekend. The uh, reprofiling and flattening of a few of the exit curves that happened during the uh, COVID break, and that kept uh, Winton busy during that during that period. Uh, that they were making improvements around the track. I mean, the commentary building we're in now been painted, been painted bright red. It really does look the part. So Winton are continuing to improve the facilities all around the venue, not only on the track but off it as well. Yeah, and on this weekend when I drove in the gate I actually saw they had some excavators and yes. some other trucks yep. and things outside so they're sort of like doing some resurfacing work sort of in that area just immediately inside the gate so you know they're really putting in the time and effort to, uh, to continue to make sure the facility is one of the best you know permanent racetrack facilities in the country. Yeah absolutely and I just noticed uh, passing us by K two laps down but back out on the racetrack so we'll get some points uh, if he can finish the race in uh, what is now 13th two laps down you can see on your timing screen so that's good news and some uh, good Hall of Points uh, for 13th in the feature, that's for certain. Yeah, well, that's the important thing, isn't it? You're just making sure you've got some points while your other competitors that you would typically find yourselves battling against throughout the series across the year, uh, where well, you've got points to, uh, to grab them, you take them with two hands. As uh, I did hear on the uh, the audio there, some protesting of tyres. I'm not sure if that was a, a car in the background or if it was a uh, the cars that we're watching on screen here just pushing a little bit too hard. Bruckner kicking up a wheel there. I actually saw when he was going through that part of the course, the wheel kicked up. It didn't even look like the wheel was moving. Mm. Uh, you know, the left rear just sort of cocked up and then it, I couldn't see it rotating. No, they certainly do uh, cock a couple of wheels or cock the uh, left rear wheel up around turn number eight. And I reckon they do the same at turn number nine. We just can't see it because it's uh, the wrong side. side of the camera. But you see the cars. These guys continuing to close up. Morales, I think, is uh, catching up now as well. Less than a second at the end of the last lap, but I reckon that's a lot less than a second now. This is very much a three-way fight for sixth position. Uh, Murray further down the road in fifth. Looking at the uh, Murray livery, it's mm. very similar to a Cooper Murray livery in Carrera Cup many years ago. So I'm not sure if uh, it's any relation to Cooper Murray. I'm, I'll find that out uh, in between uh, this race and uh, the next round. But yeah, I think it's an incredible coincidence. It's almost an identical livery to Porsche Carrera Cup uh, series winner Cooper Murray's Porsche livery of many years ago. There you go. There's your gap on the screen there. So about a second and a half covers these three cars in the group. Of course, they are nine and a half seconds behind the, uh, the fifth place car of Murray, who's uh, himself about six seconds behind fourth place Charlie Nash. Morales, I'm just not sure if he's uh, catching up or if he's just trying to maintain the gap here because there's it's a bit of a cat and mouse type arrangement here with Packham and Bruckner. There's strengths and weaknesses at different parts of the circuit, but I don't think Bruckner's got any serious heat for Packham uh, in the second half of the lap. He always does, just doesn't seem to be close enough to you know, have a go under brakes at turn 11. He's not sort of really close enough here to get underneath the, uh, the 124 SCTR machine and really command a bit of space. Yeah, I agree. This is where he's closest, but unfortunately that's where you can't really overtake around the uh, Winton venue unless you get some real cooperation from the uh, driver around you. Although, he's got a nice run out of there as Bruckner, but uh, is he going to be close enough? I reckon Packham's already looking like he'll probably defend the move down into turn number 11. He doesn't, but that's because Bruckner is not close enough this time around. So they continue line astern around turn number 11 into turn 12. Oh, that's close to a nudge. Uh, no contact, though, which is a fair play. But, yes, that was mighty close. It's affected his run, though, out of the corner, Bruckner. And that's allowed Packham to pull away. And we're being informed last lap of the race has commenced and this battle very much on Bruckner looking now he's missed the apex there of turn one that's going to cost him because it's going to ruin his momentum up the hill it's going to leave him vulnerable to Morales Morales looking to the inside can he break late enough he's going for it big send up the inside but 
around the outside. Bruckner holding on to this point and does so. Good race in between these two. Yeah, great race craft. Door was very much left open there. They left each other a bit of space. So let's see if he can hold on and maybe have another little bit of a look here up at turn seven. That is the next passing opportunity around the big left hand sweeper it's just sort of got to be very very patient here watch out for the curb at turn six that sort of has upset the momentum for morales he grabbed a little bit too much curb and the car wheel hopped on him and then bruckner covered the line into turn seven no passing opportunity there the next one comes at turn 10. yeah it's all too uh, playful still with half a lap to go and here he is Cadell Ambrose coming around the final corner. Had no victories coming into this weekend. He's going to leave with three. Fantastic stuff from young Cadell Ambrose. Family at the, win, uh, at the fence cheering him on. Well done, mate. Three race victories, three from three, and the championship lead in XLs. Awesome stuff. What a fantastic weekend for the youngster. He's going to be absolutely on cloud nine after that one, just like his folks were after race one yesterday. So Lodge home for second, Tompkins third, Nash will be fourth. So top three on points for the round, Ambrose, Lodge, and then Charlie Nash. This battle's still raging on. It's a case of uh, Packham has managed to just break away and leave the two behind, Bruckner and Morales, to sort of wrestle it over the line for the last couple of spots there with uh, Bruckner home in seventh, Morales in eighth. Then you're going to look a bit further afield to Scott Appledore, who's ninth, coming across the line in a few moments' time. Here he comes in the number 32 Hughes Brothers removals machine. And Carly Fleming, a, uh, a top 10 finish, and uh, she's about uh, 17 or so seconds behind the ninth place finisher in Appledore. Great stuff again in Circuit Excels. Victorian State Race Series brought to us this year by Triple Eight Home Loans. And that was a good way to finish the racing action this weekend, wasn't it, Darren? Fantastic, Dan. Well done, Steve DeVries. There's the results. Cadell Ambrose, three from three. What a fantastic weekend for him. We've done it all this weekend for Triple Eight Home Loans and a Blendline TV. And we have got plenty of racing coming for the rest of the season your way. Next round will be at Phillip Island on the 26th. 27th and 28th of May. So we're looking forward to getting to round number three. Round four, of course, will be August 11, 12, 13.